Deer are an essential part of our ecosystem. But there is a problem. With the extinction of native predators such as wolves and lynx, the number of deer in Britain has been steadily increasing. The red deer and the roe deer are Britain's only native species. The fallow deer was introduced in Norman times and has since become naturalised in the environment. The Reeves monkjack, seeker and Chinese water deer all arrived in the 19th and 20th centuries from Asia. And now all these species have little to naturally balance their populations at a sustainable level. Their numbers are now at the highest for a thousand years, with around two million now living in Britain. And this is causing intensive overbrowsing in our woodlands. Many plant species cannot cope with this pressure and are forced out. And as a result, our forests are losing their biodiversity, dominated by the few species that deer don't eat, and turning into monocultures of rhododendron, ivy and brambles, forming a thick understory, preventing light from reaching the forest floor and hobbling new growth. And this has serious impacts for wildlife too. Birds like nightingales have declined by 50% in some areas. And the situation is even more dire in the highlands. Tree roots secure the topsoil and a strong canopy shields the ground from wind and rain. But as the vast herds strip the forests bare, the hillsides erode away, threatening land for both agriculture and wildlife. And the risk of flooding downstream increases as well, as runoff from the hills isn't absorbed by vegetation. And the loss of trees strips nutrients from the soil. And there are agricultural impacts as well. Deer cause an estimated 4.3 million in damages to cereal crops alone each year. So, what is the solution? Currently, around 350,000 deer are culled each year by shooting, with around 100,000 of these being red deer in Scotland. Determining the effectiveness of this nationwide cull is difficult. Some areas have seen success, in others population growth has only been halted, and in others it's continued to rise. In Scotland it seems to be holding red deer numbers in check, for now, and at great expense and labour. This cull has attracted significant opposition, by both animal rights activists and some scientists. Ethically, it is argued that killing animals for any reason, including to protect biodiversity, is wrong. And after all, the species most imperiling biodiversity and natural habitats is not deer, but humans. It is also argued that culling might actually increase the fertility of the remaining deer by reducing their competition for resources. Groups involved in deer management, such as the Deer Initiative, National Gamekeepers Association and British Deer Society all support a cull, although they do suggest localised, targeted culls, as opposed to a widespread initiative. A study by the University of East Anglia suggested that only by killing 50-60% to of Rowan Monkjack each year could current growth be halted. Contrastingly, the wildlife trusts say any cull must be a last resort, and founded on strong science and carried out in a humane way. In Scotland, the John Muir Trust, National Trust for Scotland, RSPB Scotland and Scottish Wildlife Trust all favour strong culling to protect the decreasing biodiversity of the highlands. Evidently, culling is fiercely debated. It's an emotional topic and a tough word to swallow. But the ecological devastation wrecked by deer means that by some method, their numbers must be controlled. So what are the alternatives? It has been suggested that contraceptives, given either by feed or injection to female deer, might prevent the rising numbers. But none of these chemicals have been licensed in the UK, the field is largely experimental, and there is a risk of other animals ingesting them. But is this issue really as simple as to cull or not to cull? After all, Britain doesn't have just one deer problem. 
it has three, and therefore there must be at least three solutions. Firstly, red deer in the highlands are pushing the ecosystems to a breaking point. In areas with sufficient habitat and local support, bringing back the wolf would have strong regenerative effects on the hills without the need for a cull. But wolves cannot live everywhere in Scotland, and in these areas a cull remains essential. But by employing tenant farmers to cull instead of the big estates would benefit the local residents, a much fairer system than currently in place, and the meat could build a market for low carbon alternatives to beef. Secondly, there are too many deer in our forests, but at least two areas in Scotland have been identified as being able to support populations of Eurasian lynx. Bringing back the lynx would reduce deer numbers in these areas through direct predation, and like the wolves, they may force changes in deer foraging patterns, allowing the forest cover to increase. But again, most of Britain is unsuitable for lynx reintroduction. Is there another species that might help restore Britain's degraded ecosystems? Wild boar. They won't hunt deer, but they would break up the bramble monocultures and create more diverse forests. And by competing with deer for the same food, they may curtail the deer population expansion. And thirdly, we have too many deer in the countryside. There's no habitat for large carnivores here. Perhaps localised sterilisation of female deer through trapping, spaying and release might provide a non-lethal method of population control. It reduced white-tailed deer numbers in Fairfax, Virginia by 28% in five years. Crucially, this method won't increase the fertility of the surviving deer as a cull might. But this method would be expensive, and some say impossible. There is no easy answer to this crisis. Nowhere is the issue more polarised than Scotland, where culling is the latest manifestation of a complex series of environmental and social injustices, and where the memories of mass dispossessions and clearances linger. And unfortunately, the reintroduction of carnivores can't solve all these problems, and so culling must, in some areas, remain an unpleasant reality. But in the areas where they can be responsibly brought back, they could be our greatest allies in our struggle to turn the tide of Britain's biodiversity crisis.